everyone. Good morning, everyone, on this beautiful, sunny um, morning, fall morning in Seattle, or almost fall morning. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker this morning, Christine, Dr. Christine Johnston, with whom I've had the pleasure of working with for a long time. Um, she is the um, director, uh, our regional director of the STD Prevention Training Center, along with many other roles, including associate program director for the University of Washington Infectious Disease Fellowship, where she is training and mentoring um, future infectious disease physicians. But she is an expert in all things sexually transmitted, and so she is going to be giving us the STI update um, for 2021, which was is a very long awaited guidelines was supposed to be released last year. So thank you so much, Christine, for doing this talk this morning. Great. Uh, thank you, Sharisha. And thanks everyone for being here to learn about the updates in the 2021 STI treatment guidelines. Um, and thanks for the introduction, Sharisha. Uh, these are my disclosures. Um, and I just want to acknowledge before starting uh, my colleagues at the California STD Prevention Training Center, Rosalind Plotzker and Ina Park, as well as our very own Hillary Liss uh, for sharing some slides and, and helping with some content. Um, so thank you to them. Um, so today I'm going to focus on changes to the uh, 2021 STI guidelines. Uh, these are now available. As uh, Sharisha mentioned, we were waiting for quite some time for these to come out, delayed by COVID. Um, but we're really happy that they're, that they're here and uh, want to make sure that we're implementing all of the new recommendations in our clinical practice. So the goals today are to share those updates in the 2021 STI treatment guidelines. We'll talk about some of the background, some of the rationale for the changes, and also, again, just make sure that we're uh, practicing according to these updated guidelines. Now, these guidelines are uh, go through quite a rigorous process, and I just wanted to let you know how they are developed. Um, the CDC uh, has a staff and assigns a subject matter expert for every uh, subject area. Then there are key questions that are developed along with a systematic review of the evidence and these very long tables of evidence that are created. Background papers have also been written and will hopefully be published sometime later uh, this year to, again, go over all of the evidence that made up the recommendations. And then there was a three-day guidelines meeting in June uh, 2019. Many people from University of Washington attended as well as others. Um, we met and went over all of the evidence and then uh, answered the key questions, graded the quality of the evidence. Um, and eventually wrote the guidelines. Uh, there were also critical gaps in knowledge that were identified and hopefully will be our future research agenda. So again, this is not a, a short process. It's really uh, rigorous to come to this, this final document. There were some big themes, I think, in this year's uh, STI uh, treatment guidelines and at the meeting. Um, and they really included antimicrobial resistance and, and stewardship and really thinking about how are we using our antibiotics and how are they contributing to uh, potential resistance. So I really focused, of course, on Neisseria, gonorrhea, one of the urgent threats to with uh, antimicrobial resistance that's been identified by the CDC, uh, as well as mycoplasma genitalium, which as I'll show is rapidly uh, acquiring resistance. Um, I think for the future, something to keep an eye on is resistance-guided therapy, some assays that can help us choose antibiotics in real time, um, and also paying attention to antibiotic allergies and making sure that if we're not using an antibiotic uh, due to allergy, that it's really warranted. Another really exciting theme of this year was having some really wonderful uh, randomized controlled trial data to back up how we're treating infections. So I'll show some data for rectal chlamydia, uh, trichomonas, as well as PID, and then some ongoing issues with diagnostics um, for, uh, and, and, and advances in diagnostics for BB, uh, mycoplasma, and HSV. So um, one of the first big changes as well is that the document is no longer known as the STD treatment guidelines, but the STI treatment guidelines. 
Um, th this was done for many reasons. Uh, STD really refers to the disease state. It's more stigmatizing. Um, and STI really recognizes that many of these infection infections are asymptomatic. They don't necessarily cause disease in real time, um, refer referring more to the pathogen rather than the syndrome that they cause. And it really, I think, promotes the sexual health model where uh, we're uh, preventing STIs and by treating and screening for STIs, we're preventing STDs. So that's part of that name change. I also wanted to make you aware of a new sexual history taking guide. Uh, this is uh, uh, shown here and there's a link to it there. The CDC framework has been the five P's um, as shown here. And one of the most problematic things about the five P's was the way they asked about uh, partners, it used to be men, women, or both. Now they are asking simply, what is the gender of your sexual partners? Um, so uh, advance forward, I think. They also are um, uh, having as their fifth P, pregnancy intention, uh, recognizing that some people may want to get pregnant. So they're um, rather than just focusing on prevention. Um, some of the caveats still in the guidelines, they do use gender-based recommendations. Um, they are in our very uh, binary, I would say. There are screening guidelines for women and men um, and uh, really for, for clinical purposes when they're uh, talking about these uh, genders, I would just say they're, they're really considering the anatomy and anatomic sites of exposures, but they um, we could still go farther with uh, our, um, our use of gender. Uh, in addition there, they use um, MSM and transgender uh, a lot and there, there could be still again, more inclusive language. However, I will be presenting the guidelines in the way that they do just to um, prevent confusion. Okay, so um, starting with screening recommendations, um, I put here just the screening uh, recommendations for persons living with HIV. Um, for uh, chlamydia and gonorrhea, uh, really um, at first evaluation, then annually if sexually active and more frequent depending on risk, risk behaviors, um, especially for uh, MSM. Um, we may be screening more frequently, uh, and this would be also encompassing extragenital screening if exposure is, um, is occurring. Um, as well, syphilis, uh, kind of same, same time frame for evaluation. Um, for HSV, you could consider doing at the first HIV evaluation. Um, I'll go over the issues with the HSV uh, sero serologic uh, tests that we have. Um, trichomonas in women should be done at first evaluation and then annually. Uh, cervical cancer is just following other guidelines. There's nothing new in the, um, in the document, but you should uh, be screening at first evaluation, um, repeating within six months, and then with three normal consecutive pap PAPs, you can go to every three years. Um, they are recommending a, a digital anal rectal exam for uh, uh, patients who may have uh, extra genital warts or any anal exposures um, for at first evaluation and then annually, as well as hepatitis B and C um, with hep C screening uh, annually if sexually active for MSM. So really, again, nothing new here for people with HIV. Um, just to highlight for um, STI screening in pregnant cis women, uh, uh, if you have a patient who already has HIV, obviously you're not gonna be um, testing again, um, but for patients, um, the syphilis recommendations have really changed to incorporate more syphilis testing um, and uh, testing at pre the first prenatal visit and then at 24 to 28 weeks. Uh, plus delivery. Um, and I'll go over that more in detail as well. And then the other big change for pregnancy is testing for hep C with every pregnancy, um, unless you have a very low prevalence of, um, of hepatitis C. And then um, incorporating chlamydia and gonorrhea at the first prenatal visit, um, plus retesting in the third trimester if 25 years or at risk. Right now, they're not recommending screening for 
mycoplasma genitalium or trichomonas uh, for uh, pregnant women or pregnant people. Um, and then this is just um, pulling out the STI screen for uh, cis MSM. Um, uh, again, I kind of went over all of this, but um, nothing really new here, uh, except um, potentially uh, anal cancer screening with an annual uh, exam. Of course, we're awaiting the data from the anchor study to help guide us with, with pap smears for screening. Okay, and then for STI screening in transgender persons, really based on their current anatomy and um, gender of sex partners, uh, transgender persons who have sex with cisgender men are really at similar risk for STIs as um, cis MSM, so you could default to that pathway. Um, and then uh, for transgender women who've had a vaginoplasty, um, you'll do GC and CT at all sites of exposure. Um, and whether to do a urine versus neovaginal swab is not specified. Um, for trans men with um, metoidoplasty, you will do, um, uh, if the vagina is still present, you can use a cervical or vaginal swab to screen as well. Um, and then these are the recommendations for adolescents. Um, and this is an important comment for uh, women in general. Um, is considering rectal GC and CT screening and pharyngeal GC screening based on um, sexual history and, and risk. Okay, great. Um, there are some guidelines as well on sexual assault and um, doing the initial evaluation now, um, including both men and women um, and uh, really doing NATS at any site, uh, NATS for GC and chlamydia at any site where there's been penetration or attempted penetration, um, doing the serology, uh, as well as um, for women doing uh, TVAG NAT testing uh, and uh, looking for uh, yeast or uh, for, some, for pathogens that would cause um, vaginitis, BV and candidiasis. Um, and then for MSM, doing the um, GC and CT screening um, at all sites, even if, uh, if exposed, even if they weren't ex exposed during the assault. Um, and then for presumptive treatment for sexual assault, uh, they would receive chlamydia and gonorrhea, uh, trichomonas if they are women, emergency contraceptive contraception, uh, if there's any concern for pregnancy, hep B, and then HPV vaccination could be given for survivors who are aged nine to 26 and not, not completely vaccinated. Um, and of course you see in Madison Clinic uh, patients who are receiving HIV PEP, um, which may be given on a case by case basis based on risk. Okay, so that's a, a very quick tour through the screening guidelines. Um, but again, overall, not a lot of large changes in the way we're doing our STI screening. Now I'm gonna talk about some of the changes to treatment. We'll go starting with chlamydia. Um, and uh, chlamydia, has, there's been a big change where doxycycline is now the preferred treatment for chlamydia at any site. Um, so the recommended regimen now for chlamydia among adolescents and adults is doxycycline, uh, 100 twice a day for seven days. And azithromycin has been moved to an alternative regimen. Uh, levofloxacin could also be used um, if, uh, if for some reason you were, able, were unable to use the others. Um, and I wanna go over the basis for uh, this recommendation. There have been a lot of uh, studies performed looking at doxy versus azithro for your genital CT. Um, and you can see here that um, both for doxy, which is shown in red and azithro in blue, you have very high rates of cure, regardless of which regimen you use. Um, one of the um, largest studies in a, a, an RCT uh, performed by Will Geisler um, showed 100% efficacy for doxy and 97% for urogenital CT. So, um, however, um, given uh, some of the findings for uh, resistance in gonorrhea, um, which I'll show in a minute, uh, as well as 
just seeing this 100% cure rate, uh, uh, they decided to prefer doxycycline for your genital CT. Um, however, there may still be some situations where you may want to consider using azithromycin. That would be in pregnancy. Um, that would be in people who you had concerns about their ability to adhere to a seven day regimen for whatever reason. Um, and I've heard a, we, there was a very vigorous debate at the guidelines meeting about adolescents, um, both because of concerns about adherence and also concerns about um, that they may not want to be taking a medicine uh, at home. It may not be safe for them for whatever reason. So that may be a situation with your genital CT that you could consider azithromycin. And of course, if you had issues with um, allergy or intolerance to doxy, you could consider azithromycin. That's really different for, than what we've found for uh, rectal chlamydia. Um, and this was really a landmark study uh, performed by, led by Julie uh, Dombrowski here, um, a double-blind uh, RCT looking at MSM with rectal chlamydia. And they were randomized to doxy versus azithro and the primary outcome was cure at four weeks. Um, they had a, quite a large sample size, 135 total. And what they found is in the doxy group, which is shown here in blue, 100% um, cure rates um, in uh, uh, the complete case population and tend to treat population. So, uh, excuse me, per protocol. Um, uh, so very high cure rates versus only in the 70s for azithromycin. Um, and that's a 26% difference in cure rate and it is highly statistically significant. So really now doxy is superior to azithromycin for rectal chlamydia and really for rectal chlamydia, you should be using doxy um, unless um, you know, that, that's really the, the preferred treatment. So um, important uh, change and really great to have these data um, to, to back up our, our decision-making. Um, just quickly for chlamydia and pregnancy, uh, the recommended regimen is azithromycin, uh, one gram uh, in a, as a single dose. A amoxicillin could be used as an alternative and um, there should be a test of cure at three to four weeks in pregnancy. Um, for uh, uh, those who are diagnosed with chlamydia during pregnancy. Okay, I'm gonna switch now to uh, gonorrhea. Um, and uh, the big news in gonorrhea is that um, the, the organism is rapidly acquiring resistance to our antibiotics that we prefer to use. And these are data from uh, the uh, GISP in 2009, uh, and the GISP kind of tracks antimicrobial resistance. In 2009, 76% uh, of um, isolates were susceptible to at least, or to all antibiotics. Um, and there was uh, still a substantial amount of resistance, but it's really grown over the decade. So that now uh, 45, only 45% of, um, of, of uh, organisms are susceptible to uh, our current antibiotics. And you can see here what's really grown is resistance to two or more antibiotics, um, as well as fluoroquinolone resistance and tetracycline resistance. So really um, disturbing numbers. Um, this just shows what's happened with azithromycin. Um, and you can see here that azithromycin shown in pink uh, has, really, um, has really expanded in terms of the isolates that are resistant. Um, this corresponds to the time when uh, azithro uh, was recommended for dual therapy for um, gonorrhea um, and really is um, contributing to some of the changes that we're finding for uh, that are recommended for um, treatment of gonorrhea. So um, these are the new uh, treatment guidelines. And I will say that um, this effort was really led by uh, Dr. Lindley Barbie. So um, she uh, really uh, did a great job bringing together these data and uh, making this major uh, evidence-based change in, um, in treatment. So um, what is now recommended, and I will mention these these recommendations came out uh, pre-guidelines uh, last fall, 
Um, but the guideline is ceftriaxone 500 milligrams uh, for, times one um, for people who are less than 150 uh, kilograms. Those who are greater should get a full gram of ceftriaxone. And so this is an increased dosage compared to what we used to use. Um, and with no dual therapy, however, um, if chlamydia has not been excluded, you should treat for chlamydia with the doxycycline, the seven day regimen. Um, and so again, no longer recommending the dual therapy with azithromycin. Um, the other uh, change is to perform a test of cure at seven to 14 days after treatment for pharyngeal gonorrhea. Um, it is well recognized that the pharynx is uh, uh, kind of a reservoir site for uh, gonorrhea and uh, can be more difficult to treat there. Uh, I will say that the test of cure at seven to 14 days has already been a little bit problematic just because if you're testing earlier, you may be detecting organism uh, or be, be de detecting nucleic acid that doesn't represent viable organism. So uh, people are really recommending going more on the 14 days rather than the seven, stretching out as long as possible um, so that you're sure that you're really detecting viable organism uh, if you're testing positive. Um, the alternative treatment for, for gonorrhea, uh, if ceftriaxone is not available, if you need to use a PO option is cefixime. Uh, and again, the dose is, is higher at 800 milligrams uh, times one, treating with doxy if chlamydia has not been exclu excluded. Um, if you are having a cephalosporin allergy, you would use gentamicin uh, plus two grams of azithromycin. Uh, and really for um, pharyngeal gonorrhea, the ceftriaxone is the preferred uh, treatment, um, again, because of that uh, issue that it's more difficult to treat in the pharynx. Um, one change that has been made in the guidelines is some allowance to treat uh, or to provide expedited partner therapy for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Um, we are now in the United States, all states are able to prescribe EPT. Um, it was previously only recommended um, in uh, heterosexual men and women, and that was uh, partly because that's where the data were, um, and partly because of uh, a fear that, um, that uh, MSM would need to be treated or tested for other STI as well, and potentially assessed for PrEP, uh, and um, if they were did not have HIV. But they're now recommending a shared decision-making model for EPT for MSM. Um, so it's uh, now permissible uh, to do this per the CDC guidelines, um, but it should be discussed that there really aren't the data to, to back it up um, the way that uh, we do have for um, heterosexual men and women. However, um, it is also an opportunity to improve our, our treatment for these populations. So it is now a possibility. Um, and as, as always, giving uh, package oral medicine is, is preferred. Um, and every uh, jurisdiction, I think, is, is different in how they're, they're rolling this out and getting EPT to partners, uh, partnering with pharmacies or having it available. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about uh, mycoplasma genitalium. Um, uh, in a really uh, nice prevalence study, uh, looking at men with urethritis, it was found that more than one in four men with urethritis actually have mycoplasma genitalium. Um, so it is a very common pathogen. However, uh, right now, I really wanna emphasize that population-based screening for M genitalium is not recommended. Um, we should not be screening anyone for M genitalium. Uh, we do now have diagnostic testing available for M genitalium. Uh, you can use a NAT test that was uh, one that was FDA approved in 2019. Um, and it can be used on a variety of um, sample types as shown here. And the time when you would consider testing is for people who have persistent urethritis that fails initial treatment 
or persistent PID or cervicitis. So not, um, not necessarily testing even at the first uh, occurrence of, um, of urethritis or PID or cervicitis, but really reserving for uh, persistent uh, infection. And part of the reason is uh, we're seeing just this very high prevalence of M genitalium resistance. Um, this is a kind of a survey that was performed at multiple sites around the United States. Um, 23S uh, indicates macrolide resistance and PAR-C is uh, fluoroquinolone resistance. Um, and so what you can see here is very high rates of, of resistance to azithromycin um, to, uh, and also to fluoroquinolones and also to both um, azithro and fluoroquinolones. And if you look specifically at Seattle, we have extremely high rates here, 80% um, of uh, of organisms had at least one resistance mutation. Um, and so this is an uh, organism that's really rapidly uh, acquiring resistance. Um, the treatment for M genitalium, uh, if we had resistance testing available, this would be a time when you'd use um, uh, diagnostic testing to guide your antimicrobial therapy. Um, this is not available at this time, but hopefully will be sometime in the future. Um, and in that case, if you had a macrolide sensitive organism, you'd give doxy first for seven days to decrease the bacterial burden. And um, in other studies, it's been shown that this is effective. So doxy followed by one gram of azithromycin uh, times one, and then another of a total of a four day course. Um, if you had a macrolide resistant organism, you'd use doxy followed by moxy. And given the high rate of azithromycin resistance, um, if the resistance testing is not available, we need to default to moxy. So doxy and moxy, and that's probably what we'll be using. So that's a two week course of antibiotics um, for, and including our fluoroquinolone. Um, and, and so it's an aggressive regimen. It's a, a lot to need to, to treat this organism. So we really wanna make sure that we're treating it when it's causing uh, symptoms and uh, clinically relevant infection um, and um, uh, using it appropriately and testing and treating appropriately for that organism. So uh, probably much more to follow uh, with M genitalium and uh, we will uh, eagerly await this resistance guided testing. All right, so I'm gonna talk now about some of the syndromes, um, uh, PID and uh, epididymitis, urethritis, et cetera. Um, so again, another exciting uh, place where we have some uh, RCT data that is leading to a new recommendation. Uh, so uh, the recommended regimen for outpatient PID is ceftriaxone uh, or cefoxetin um, with probenicid plus doxy uh, and now also with metronidazole. Uh, and that's going to be a 14-day regimen um, to, with, with doxy and metronidazole. And this is based on some data from uh, uh, our, quite a large RCT with 233 cis women who had uh, PID. Um, they received ceftriaxone plus doxy and were randomized to metronidazole or placebo. And their primary outcome was clinical improvement at three days. And this was actually similar between the two arms, but they had additional outcomes, their secondary outcomes of uh, anaerobic organisms in the endometrium. Um, and that was uh, lower uh, in metronidazole than in the placebo arm. And they also looked at cervical motion tenderness uh, and pelvic, uh, the reduction of cervical motion tenderness and pelvic tenderness, and found that that was also improved with metronidazole as compared to placebo. So based on those recommendations, uh, that those findings, they are recommending to use metronidazole as part of any outpatient regimen for PID. Um, for urethritis and cervicitis, really the ideal treatment is based on knowing what pathogen you're treating. Um, if 
you do need to treat empirically, which we often do. You want to treat for doxy, or sorry, treat for chlamydia um, using doxy, and add treatment for gonorrhea if if your patient is at risk, if you're in a high prevalence setting. Um, and again, then you would use the ceftriaxone, 500 milligram dose, preferably. Um, for proctitis and epididymitis, uh, uh, proctitis, you're going to use ceftriaxone and doxy, basically treating uh, empirically for uh, gonorrhea and chlamydia. Um, if patients do have uh, uh, concern for LGB um, with symptoms of bloody discharge, uh, any mucosal or perianal ulcers, um, or tenesmus, or uh, in the setting of a rectal CT positive, you could extend the doxycycline to three weeks. Um, there were some interesting observational data that have been published showing that even LGB strains can be treated with uh, one to two weeks of, uh, of doxycycline. But if you do have more of a severe case, and you're worried about LGB, um, it's still recommended to extend the doxy uh, for three weeks. Um, for epididymitis, if you're suspecting CT or GC based on history, you're going to use ceftriaxone plus doxy. Um, if you have a patient where you're suspecting enterics, you could use uh, levofloxacin. Um, and uh, if you are sus suspecting both, you could use ceftriaxone plus plus Levo, uh, remembering that Levo is also an alternative therapy for chlamydia as well. Okay, I'm going to talk now about general ulcer disease. Uh, maybe I'll pause just for one minute and see if there's any questions, because uh, this is a lot of information. Uh, yeah, we have one question. Uh, why would pregnancy screening recommendations be only for cisgender women? Yes, exactly. Um, I, that is how it was written, but it, it should really be um, for, uh, for pregnant people. Great. And then uh, I believe this question refers to treatment for M. genitalium. Would doxy followed by the second drug therapy be meaning not given at the same time, but sequentially? Yes, it is a sequential treatment. Um, and um, it's based on some data that show that giving doxycycline first can uh, decrease the bacterial burden, but it's not a, a curative regimen. So the idea is to do this sequential treatment with doxy to decrease the bacterial burden and then kind of uh, mop up therapy, if you will, of either uh, moxie or azithro. Great, one last question. How should we approach patients who are exposed to M. genitalium to pharynx or rectum? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And I think um, I would say I would um, not necessarily be screening uh, at the pharynx or the rectum or, or treating. Um, the, um, we don't, uh, have as much data that M. genitalium is causing disease in those, in those locations. Um, and again, we kind of don't want to get into um, screening and treating uh, for um, uh, situations where you're kind of going to be chasing um, a, a resistant organism. Um, with improved therapy with uh, or newer drugs that are that the organism is less resistant to, maybe those uh, recommendations would change. But as of now, um, I would not um, be screening or treating people who are exposed at those sites. Those are great questions. And if any, I'm happy to hear if anyone else is doing anything differently, because I think this is a, a great area. Okay. Should I keep going, Sharisha? Yes, please do. Okay, great. So um, now uh, switching to uh, genital ulcer disease. Um, just a brief word about genital herpes. Uh, HSV2 
still a very prevalent infection. Um, in 2018, uh, there's estimated 18.6 million people in the US who have HSV2 and almost or, or over half a million who are acquiring HSV2 during that single year. Um, for prevalent infections, it is more prevalent among women. They account for 65% of the prevalent infections and it is in an older population. Um, for the incident infections, uh, equal numbers of men and women are acquiring HSV2 each year. Um, these estimates do not include uh, general HSV1 infections, which would, would add uh, a lot more prevalent infections as well. Um, in terms of our diagnostics, um, if people do have a lesion present, uh, it's recommended to do type-specific HSV PCR. We do have that available now at uh, UW. Uh, HSV culture is less sensitive and really should be reserved if um, reserved for settings where you're concerned about acyclovir-resistant HSV. Um, here at UW, we actually do have uh, a genetic uh, molecular testing for acyclovir-resistant HSV at this time, but this is not widely available at other places, but do know that we do have it available here. Um, in the absence of a lesion is where it gets more difficult to uh, diagnose general herpes. As you may know, there are HSV IgG type specific serologic testing available, um, but it's not recommended to screen asymptomatic people um, based on the US uh, uh, Preventive Services Task Force. Uh, recommendation. You could consider testing people who have recurrent or atypical general symptoms, but who've had a negative PCR or culture result. Um, those who have a clinical diagnosis of general herpes without lab confirmation. Um, those with a partner with general herpes and um, people who are at higher risk, um, such as those presenting for an STI evaluation are, are often higher risk. Um, those who've had many uh, over 10 sexual partners. Um, and those people you could consider screening for symptoms of general herpes and then doing the serologic screening specifically if there's symptoms. I do think there is a big disconnect um, in general herpes between uh, patients who wanna know if they have HSV2 infection and providers who um, may not want to test because um, the test, there are some testing issues. Um, these are the pitfalls of general herpes um, testing. Uh, the FDA approved serologic assays uh, are, um, are available, but um, they have poor sensitivity for HSV-1, only about 70% sensitive. And importantly for HSV-2 have really poor specificity, only 57.4% um, uh, in uh, this, this study, and um, these findings have been replicated in many, uh, many studies. Um, in particular, the uh, enzyme immunoassays give an index value, uh, and above 1.1 is considered positive. But as you can see here, um, if an index value is 1.1 to 2.9, there's really very poor specificity, um, worse than a coin flip. And uh, gets a, it gets better if the index value is higher, but is still uh, relatively poor, particularly for people who you're giving a, a diagnosis of a chronic STI um, to. Um, so um, the recommendation is that we should be thinking about HSV2 testing similar to the way we think about uh, syphilis testing and that you wouldn't give a po someone a positive result unless you had two tests that were positive. Um, so if you're using the EIA or uh, chemiluminescent assay, and you have a low index value. Ideally, you would do confirmatory testing with either a bio kit or the, the UW Western blot. If you have a higher index value, confirmatory testing is not required. Um, however, we do know that there are false positives even at the higher index values. Um, so the, the testing really is not ideal. We are uh, spoiled here at UW because we have the Western blot available, which is the one of the gold standard tests. Um, and so you can be confident with your uh, result if you're using the UW Western blot um, with whatever test result you're getting. Um, so this is uh, more for uh, people who, who don't have access to this testing. 
In addition, it's important to know IgM testing for HSV is never recommended, it has poor sensitivity and specificity. Um, there are some other new changes to the general herpes section, mainly that um, there's uh, some uh, counseling messages that pull out HSV-1 versus HSV-2 um, and some of the different natural history with HSV-1 um, having a less severe uh, natural history, fewer recurrences over time. Um, and in terms of treatment, we really have no new therapies available or uh, vaccines or prevention strategies, but um, uh, it, for your patients who are uh, starting ART and have a low CD4 count, you could consider using suppressive acyclovir to reduce the risk of HSV2 reactivation um, because in that setting, there is an increased risk of uh, of GUD after starting ART among those who are HSV2 seropositive. And that's consistent with the uh, adult OI guidelines as well. Okay, now switching to syphilis. Um, so in terms of changes to the syphilis section, uh, they're really just mentioned some atypical presentations, uh, realizing that uh, the classic presentation of a single Painless uh, chancre is not always the way it presents. So um, uh, mentioning that you can have painful ulcers, um, you can have multiple lesions as well. Um, serologic testing with either traditional or reverse sequence algorithm is uh, either one is recommended uh, and uh, it's um, uh, neither one is preferred, I guess I would say you can, you can use either one. Uh, based on uh, what your, your institution is doing. Um, and of course, here we're doing the reverse uh, al algorithm testing now. Um, no new data on treatment for, for syphilis. Uh, penicillin G is still our recommended treatment. There is an ongoing RCT for early syphilis, looking at one versus three doses of um, benzathine penicillin. Uh, the Alternative regimens are doxy um, or ceftriaxone uh, daily for 10 days for primary or secondary infection, um, but really nothing new there. In terms of monitoring for a treatment failure, there was some clarification on how to, how to monitor and what should uh, constitute an inadequate serologic response. So uh, recognizing that a lack, uh, that a fourfold decline may not occur if you have starting out with very low pretreatment titers, uh, less than or equal to one to four. And then you should really wait 12 months uh, after primary, secondary, or early latent infection to see that fourfold decline. And it can take uh, 24 months after late latent or uh, syphilis of unknown duration. And the delays are associated with the stage of, um, of syphilis that you have with the initial RPR titer and also with the patient age. Um, another big change has been the evaluation for neuro and ocular syphilis and uh, really uh, recommending fewer LPs. So we know that a CSF evaluation is always needed if a patient has clinical signs of neurosyphilis. Um, and uh, the CSF VDRL from the CSF is, is diagnostic. Um, but if you have uh, a high lymphocyte count, high protein, that can be suggestive of, um, of neurosyphilis as well. Uh, CSF VDRL does have um, or sensi sensitivity overall. And in that setting, you would consider doing um, other further testing for syphilis. Um, for patients who have ocular syphilis or signs or symptoms of ocular syphilis, uh, a CSF is not needed unless there's also cranial nerve dysfunction. Um, so that is uh, a new uh, recommendation. We do not need to do CSF evaluation if you only have, uh, let's say, a uveitis or um, isolated ocular abnormalities. Similarly, for people who have um, auditory abnormalities, who have otosyphilis, uh, an oto exam can be done, but no CSF evaluation is necessary. And then for those who've been diagnosed with neurosyphilis 
as long as the RPR uh, response is adequate at six months, there is no need to repeat a CSF exam in that setting. So you can use the RPR response to uh, infer that um, your uh, treatment was adequate. Um, we have been seeing a resurgence of congenital syphilis, and this just shows um, in, in the red lines, the syphilis incidence in women in King County. Um, you can see a sharp rise in um, between really 2015 and 2021, but even in the last year, we had a sharp rise. Um, and uh, this is just um, uh, shown here, the number of cases uh, by quarter in, in Seattle King County just over the last two years. So we're seeing a lot more syphilis in, in women here. Um, we've had five cases of congenital syphilis in King County since 2020. Um, that was in July. Maybe there have been even more since, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, we also have seen uh, correspondingly an increase in U.S. congenital syphilis uh, throughout the country. And these data were just published last week in New England Journal projecting about 2,100 cases in 2020 um, for congenital syphilis. So this is uh, really considered a, a emergency situation. Um, syphilis in pregnancy, um, we should be doing more aggressive screening. Uh, serologic screening is always recommended at the first prenatal visit. Um, also at 24 to 28 weeks, and that is the recommendation in Seattle King County, as well as um, delivery, uh, and many jurisdictions are going to um, screening uh, uh, more than once during pregnancy, screening two to three times during pregnancy. Um, there have been some identified risk factors currently for congenital syphilis in pregnancy. They're listed here, uh, multiple partners, uh, sex with drug use, late to prenatal care, um, meth and heroin use corrections and unstable housing, uh, risk of reinfection as always based on ongoing risk behaviors and partners being treated. For syphilis that is diagnosed in pregnancy, um, there's some additional guidance around how to manage the, um, the, uh, the RPR and the, the testing. Um, so def Reinfection or treatment failure is defined as a fourfold increase in post-treatment um, titers more than two weeks after treatment. Uh, and then when you're monitoring, you want to um, repeat the RPR eight weeks after treatment, unless you have ongoing signs of primary or secondary syphilis. Um, syphilis that is diagnosed and treated at 24 weeks gestation, um, you can wait till delivery to repeat your serology and realize that more, most patients will not achieve a fourfold de decline in titers before delivery. So you may just be looking for uh, a decrease in titers, but may not hit the fourfold decline. There's just not enough time. Um, for penicillin allergy, this, again, I mentioned this at the outset, um, they really uh, are emphasizing that we should be assessing our penicillin allergies carefully. Um, and avoiding uh, not treating with penicillin or cephalosporins due to a vague history of allergy that may not be truly a IgE mediated um, allergy. Um, and so you can see here in this box too, they are calling out some low risk histories um, in patients who report a penicillin allergy, um, symptoms that you may be uh, willing to give a dose of penicillin or ceftriaxone in the setting of, of a history of allergy um, because these are unlikely to be IgE mediated. They also uh, mentioned the uh, penicillin skin testing procedures, uh, recognizing that these are becoming more available um, in the outpatient setting. Um, so I think that I feel we're pretty good here about uh, our penicillin allergies and making sure that we're taking good histories and um, only avoiding these, these agents when it truly is IgE mediated, but just another call for that. Okay, um, quickly, a couple changes to, or actually, Sharisha, do you wanna pause for any questions? Yeah, anyone have any questions? I know that people have been active in the chat as well. Oh, oh great. Yeah, we've got some HSB questions. Does a known ex previous exposure to HSB2 increase the specificity of the HSB2 IgG index value? 
Um, that's a great question. I would say uh, not, not necessarily, um, an exposure wouldn't necessarily increase uh, the index value, but it would inc increase your pretest probability of that, that testing being positive. So it is recommended that the testing be pursued in people who've had a partner with genital herpes, for instance. All right, thank you. Do you know the prevalence of acyclovir resistant HSV? What would the alternative therapy be? Yeah, great question. Uh, we're fortunate that acyclovir resistant HSV is very rare in the immunocompetent uh, patient setting. Um, in immunocompromised uh, patients, and it would be severe immunocompromised with CD4 count less than 200. Um, you can see acyclovir resistant herpes, and that would be the setting I would be worried about testing um, in patients who had persistent herpes despite acyclovir. Right now, the alternative regimens are phoscarnet, um, which is uh, IV and highly toxic. Um, and you can use topical amiquimod has been described in some studies, and there is a study looking at a new agent called pertilivir. Um, that, that, and UW was a site for that. Um, I'm not sure if it's ongoing or not. Great, thank you. Any instances where HSV IgM is indicated? How do you interpret it in the context of other HSV testing if received in a panel or elsewhere? Yeah, so that's a great question. IgM testing for HSV should never be performed. Um, it has poor sensitivity and specificity and um, it is included in some panels and uh, actually uh, some labs such as Mayo have pulled those panels uh, because people have such a hard time when they see the IgM thinking you know, that it's indicating primary infection. Um, the IgM testing, I would just disregard it if you get it in a panel. I think it is, is just not, it's not a helpful test. It's not a good test. Great, we'll take one last one here. Um, why are we not as concerned about HSV-1, given that a few years ago, the report at our virology clinic stated 50 to 60% of new cases of genital, genital herpes being caused by HSV-1? Yeah, so we do know that HSV-1 is an increasing cause of genital herpes. Um, we, the, the issue with it is it's just hard to test for. The serologic testing, if you tested for HSV-1, wouldn't tell you if you have oral or genital herpes. Um, the opportunity to make a diagnosis of genital HSV-1 is really at the time when you have a lesion and you can sample it and show it's HSV-1. So I think that um, there are you know, still concerns about genital herpes, it's just harder to make that accurate diagnosis. And then of course, with genital HSV-1, um, there is a less severe uh, natural history of disease. So fewer recurrences, less shedding, most likely less likely to transmit. Great, thank you. Great questions. Okay, just very quickly um, looking at some changes with vaginal discharge. So. Uh, bacterial vaginosis, um, we know that BV increases the risk of other STIs and some BV associated bacteria may increase the susceptibility to HIV. Um, usually we're still diagnosing BV via uh, wet mount, AMSL score, um, but there are some NATs that are available for diagnosis um, that people can be aware of. These are for symptomatic patients only. Um, and these are the, the two panels shown in yellow. Um, again, I think um, the, uh, these older methods are still useful and less expensive. Um, important to note, asymptomatic pregnant patients should not be screened for BV. Um, there is a new treatment for BV um, in the alternative regimens. Uh, the, um, you can use secnitazole as a one-time dose. This is a newer medication or a single dose of higher potency metronidazole gel or clindes vaginal cream. Um, again, these are new alternative regimens, but the recommended regimens remain uh, metronidazole, um, oral or gel or clindamycin cream. There was a review of metronidazole and alcohol and that interaction. 
Um, and uh, it was um, found that really the metronidazole does not inhibit um, the acetaldehyde dehydrogenase, which is what causes that um, uh, disulfiram reaction or that the toxicity. Um, and on the evidence review, they really didn't find any um, clinical studies showing this interaction or adverse event reporting. So they are saying now that refraining from alcohol is unnecessary during metronidazole treatment. So that's a big um, counseling point that we no longer have to um, have to make. Uh, for trichomonas, just a reminder here that this is a very prevalent infection. Um, 2.6 million prevalent infections in the US um, in 2018 and almost 7 million incident infections. Um, for screening, we kind of already went over when TVAG is recommended. Um, diagnostic testing should be performed in patients who have vaginal discharge. And there are now many FDA approved NAT tests um, that are available that improve our diagnostic um, uh, testing. Um, another big change here, uh, again, based on RCT data, is that um, single dose metronidazole is not as effective as seven days. We have known that that is true for quite some time in patients with HIV infection. Um, it's been recommended to use a seven-day regimen. Now we have RCT data showing that that is true in all, in all women, that um, a single dose regimen of metronidazole only resulted in 81% cure, whereas a seven-day regimen resulted in 89% cure. So um, uh, for all women, uh, treating with a seven day course at this point. And that's just shown here. Um, for when you do diagnose trichomonas, patients should be retested for reinfection in three months time um, uh, because there is a high rate of reinfection. So, and then for candidiasis, really um, no large changes uh, except to avoid fluconazole in pregnancy. Um, based on some, some data that it increases the risk of congenital abnormalities and spontaneous abortion. Um, I already mentioned this, so I'm gonna skip it. Um, and I'm actually in the interest of time going to go just right to um, some final slides for additional resources. Uh, the National STD curriculum is um, by really run by David Spock. It's a beautiful curriculum that's currently being updated for um, with all of these changes and is available with uh, free CME and CE credits. Um, we also have the STD clinical consultation network. If you have difficult uh, clinical questions, we can um, you can uh, submit them here and we'll get back to you within one to five days. Um, and we do have extra genital posters uh, as well, extra genital self-testing posters as well that we can send out to anyone. Um, and uh, for UW faculty, if you want to do an eval, um, that, would, that would help uh, me for the future. So I will stop there and see if there are any additional questions and thank everyone for their time. Thank you we'll so take much, Christine. See if there's any other questions from the group. Uh, excellent overview. We'll take a quick question about BV. Do you know why tinidazole isn't recommended for BV, given that there have been a handful of published trials with promising results? Um, yes, and I'm sorry um, that that's like the tinidazole is still an alternative uh, recommendation for for BV. Um, the uh, the alternatives that I mentioned were the new alternatives, but um, their tenodazole is actually still recommended as an alternative agent. I will update that slide to prevent confusion. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.